everyone, and good afternoon. Today's topic is topic 14, microorganisms and biotechnology. If you have your Cornell notes ready, this is your, okay, it's not your learning objective yet. Okay, this is the introduction part. So if we recall these seven characteristics of life, we remember Mrs. Gren, one of them is respiration. We have reproduction, excretion, nutrition, sensitivity, growth, movement. And lastly, we wanted to add this in year nine, which is cellular structure. So all living things or all things that are alive have a cellular structure. So we do consider microorganisms or any thing that have a cell is a living thing. Microorganisms are very, very small, and they are only studied with the aid of microscopes. They are unicellular. It means that they are made up of just one cell. And there are three types of microorganisms. You have viruses, bacteria, and fungi. So here we have a picture of the sizes of, or like a kind of like a comparison of sizes of different types of, we have cells here and also structures and even an atom. So we're talking about matter here, comparing different types of matter. So an atom could be about 0 0.1 nanometer. And then if you look over here, protein is about in between 1 nanometer to 10 nanometers. A poliovirus is about 10 nanometers to 100 nanometers big. So you have flu virus. And even probably your COVID-19 would be this size, about 100 nanometers. So think about how small it is and how it travels. It can literally travel through many things that's why we wear a mask to try to protect ourselves from having the virus to enter our body so here we have the mitochondria of most cells and it is bigger than the flu virus and we do see the bacteria here the bacteria is as big as our mitochondria and red blood cell is much more bigger and then we have the animal cell that's between 10 micrometers to 100 micrometers and finally a human egg cell is this big so you can see definitely around these ones poliovirus flu smallpox and bacteria they are so tiny that's what we call them the microorganisms you can only see them when you see them under a microscope and not just your light microscope that we find in lab 41 but you need to have very special microscopes to be able to see that electron microscopes might be able to be or actually is pretty good for that Okay, so let's talk about the characteristics and groups of viruses, bacteria, and fungi. And this is your learning objective 14A. Viruses. What is a virus? Virus is the simplest form of life. It's the most simple, simple of all, but we don't really consider them as truly living. Because the problem is the fact that viruses only live inside the host cell. So outside of the host cell, they don't reproduce. They don't do nothing, basically. Only when they enter the host, then they can reproduce. So here are examples of viruses and their main shape. So they do, you do have different types of shapes of viruses, actually. What are the characteristics of viruses? They're about less than 300 nanometers in size. They can only be seen under the electron microscope. They contain nucleic acid, which is DNA or RNA. And the nucleic acid is surrounded by a coat of protein. So get this, the fact that the DNA, so the hereditary material of viruses can either be DNA or RNA. So they have two forms of hereditary material. The nucleic acid, which is this part, the DNA or RNA, which is hereditary material, is surrounded by a pro coat of protein. And in HIV, they even have two coats. And the second coat is called capsid. And they reproduce only inside the living or host cells. They are also not affected by antibiotics because of the fact that they actually need to be able to only live inside the host cell. So here is just an example of the differences between RNA and DNA. You can see that RNA here only has like a single strand, but DNA has one here and another one too here. And we call this a double helix. So viruses can either have RNA or DNA. 
And this is an example of a pictomicrograph of HIV virus. You can see that they have a strand in here. They do have a membrane. And then they do have these proteins at the outside. They do look a little bit creepy. So if you have a look over here, so the nucleic acid the, is RNA for this HIV virus. You have a capsid protein that is over here that surrounds that RNA and they're about less than, so we talked about it just now, was less than 300 nanometers and this virus right here is about 120 nanometers. So the structure of a virus, if you want to put it simply, you can draw it something like this. You have an outer membrane from the cell membrane of the previous host cell. So this means from the host cell that they have infected before. And you have two coats of protein. You have the viral enzyme that is represented as this circle. And you have a DNA or, R or RNA as a single strand. And you also have additional protein molecules that are found inside that space right there. Next, let's look into bacteria. What is a bacteria? They are the simplest form of true living organisms because they can live outside the host cell. And these are examples of bacteria. Um, the one that is pretty famous, I think it's E. coli, but I don't think you can find them here. Let me just silent my phone because it's making some noise. Okie dokie. All right. Characteristics of bacteria, the size is between 0 0.5 to 5 micrometer. So they are definitely much more bigger than viruses. Viruses are about or less than around 300 nanometer. They are unicellular, means only one cell. They do not have a true nucleus. And the fact that they have DNA, that they, just now, the virus can have RNA or DNA single strand. Um, however, bacterium have a DNA instead. So only bacterium have DNA. They only have DNA that is loose in the cytoplasm. They have a cell wall. They may be pathogenic parasites. What pathogenic means is that they can cause the host diseases and they may also be saprotroph. So this word right here means that they can carry out this thing called nitrogen fixation. It means they can get the nitrogen from the air and then they can fix it and convert it into another form. So for example, nitrogen in the air, nitrogen gas into nitrates. That is called nitrogen fixation. They can be killed by antibiotics as well. Lastly, they reproduce by binary fission. So that is similar to when animal cells can divide, but when it comes to bacteria, bacterium cells, they divide what we call binary fission. It is slightly different. So there are three types of bacterium, and it depends on the shape. The This one right here, we call that the bacillus or rod shape. You have them in circular form. These are called the coccus or the sphere shape or spherical shape. And then you have the spirulous or spiral shape. So you can either call them rod, sphere, spiral, or you can call them bacillus caucus or spirulous. Binary fission is a method of asexual reproduction. It means that they do not need a female or male sex cell or gametes. So which are where single cell organisms, usually prokaryotes, so this is a group of um, classification, they use to create a copy of themselves. Another term for this process is cellular cloning. Binary fission is different from mitosis because bacterial cells do not have a true nucleus. So that is the main thing. So if we look at this picture right here, you have one bacterial cell and then they actually copy their own DNA. Remember, it, there's a strand right here, but it doesn't have a nucleus, so it's not a true nucleus. And you can see that they just divide, and then they make two of them of the same copy. That's why you can call it cellular cloning, but let's use the word binary fission. So after they replicate their DNA, they are going to replicate all the other proteins as well, and then the, they will start to separate into two single separate bacterial cells. So that's why bacteria, they can reproduce really quickly because they binary, they carry out binary fission and then they divide into two and then those two divide into four. And you can see how fast that this bacteria right here is reproducing. 
So let's recall there are three types of bacteria um, types. You have the rod shape, you have the spiral shape, and you have the, what was the circular shape one called? The sphere, yeah, spherical shape. And this right here is the bacillus, aka the rod shaped bacteria. This is a picture of an example of a diagram of a bacteria, and you have the bacterial circular DNA here. And they also have the separate DNA in circular form called plasmids. And remember, they have a cell wall. That's why we have two layers here, cell wall, cell membrane, cytoplasm. So how do you draw the structure of a bacterium? So bacterium means one, bacteria means a lot of them. So let's start off with a simpler form. You have a cell wall on the outside and then cytoplasm in the middle. DNA strand, not within a clearly defined nucleus, just like that. You have a cell membrane. And then you have a capsule on the outside right here. And also not to forget the small circular DNA called plasmids that may also may also be found in a bacteria cell. So this is an electron microscope image of the DNA of a plasmid. So we draw them in circle, but in reality, they kind of look like it's a squiggly, but it is kind of like a circular, I mean, uh, never ending, ending, I don't know. Basically, they do look like a, like that, not a true circle, but that's how we draw them. Okay, plasmids. Those plasmids are really important. Plasmid is a small double strand of DNA, usually circular, but sometimes linear, that exists in independently of the chromosome. So they are also capable of self-replicating themselves. So you can see that there's lots of plasmids here. Each plasmid carries only a few genes, not the whole, the whole genetic code of that, of that bacteria. So plasmids can come in many different sizes and they are used for many different purposes in biotechnology. They first made their mark in the field of recombinant DNA in the 1970s, being used as a tool to insert genes into bacteria to encourage the production of therapeutic proteins such as human insulin. So what this part right here just means is that what people did was they took a human insulin gene from a human cell and they added it onto the bacterial plasmid. Then they put that plasmid back into the bacteria and grew them in a culture. That means that they grew it in a petri dish and then actually that bacteria itself made the protein insulin and that is how people can make and extract insulin. So this one right here when we're talking about using organisms to make something that is what we call biotechnology. Okay, last group is the fungi. Fungi is a bit larger of a microorganism and they are usually visible to the naked eye. So what are the characteristics of a fungus? Fungus, I would assume as one fungi as in many. They do not have chlorophyll. They are heterotrophic. That means that they digest large molecules with enzymes and absorb the soluble products. That means they would release their digestive enzymes outside and then they would pretty much absorb the the, the food, the nutrients that they have digested. They can either be parasites or saprotrophs. So remember, saprotrophs mean that they can fix nitrogen, mean that they can convert the nitrogen in the air and then make it into something that can be absorbed by the cells, like nit nitrogen gas to nitrates. Parasitic means that they need to be in a host cell and they also can cause diseases. They have cell walls, but then it's called chitin. So the molecule is chitin. It's not, for example, plant cells have cell walls made up of cellulose, but this time the cell wall is made up of chitin. So one thing that makes me confused sometimes is the fact that I think of fungus as in being green, but not all of them are, and they really do not have chlorophyll. So try to remember that because I always forget that. They are made up of large number of tubular threads called hyphae, which are intertwined. So when you have hyphae and lots of hyphae together, they form what we call mycelium. Hyphae do not divide into different individuals, so they are actually part of the same organism. The lining of the cytoplasm has many nuclei and central space in the hyphae 
is a vacuole filled with vacuolar sap. They also store carbohydrate in the form of glycogen, similar to animal cells, and they reproduce by producing spores. So here we have a picture of the mycelium. Remember, when you have hyphae and lots of them, they so when they are intertwined, the threads you call mycelium, and this is an individual hyphae. You can see that it's not really divided into different cells because they are actually pretty much connected to each other. And the cell wall is made up of chitin. So here is just a much more simpler diagram that you can see that this is not individual cells. It's actually part of the same, same organism there. So I'm just going to stop there for our first learning objective and I'll continue this learning objective next time. So thank you so much for doing this with me and I'll see you guys another day. Bye!